Welcome to Code Savvy Presents, a podcast about computer science, technology, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, so to kick us off, I guess I would just have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do and, and what, what your involvement with Cargill is. Okay. Um, I'm Donna Niles. Uh, I've been at Cargill for some time with experience coming through marketing, sales and account management, um, supply chain management. Um, and I've been in my role on what is called the Growth Ventures and Emerging Products team. We support Cargill's Protein North America business. Um, and we're generally focused on animal protein. Um, and I like to say that I think I have one of the best roles, if not the best roles in our business. Um, I have the privilege of working with startup companies and new technologies and figuring out how we can pioneer or pilot um, or make investments in these companies and then build relationships out. We call it future-proofing work. It's true long-term innovation. We're looking at ways to set us up as a company for success as the market and the industry changes. Cool. Are there any uh, any companies that people might be familiar with that kind of got their start that way, or any projects um, that you have you've seen come through that process and kind of flourish? Um, one that I have going on right now is we have a signed partnership agreement with an early stage startup company called Stenco. Stenco produces a plant-based um, oxygen barrier, which if we're really going down the rabbit hole, lots of recyclable packaging options exist today. Just think about like a, a cereal box that's made of cardboard, so that's completely recyclable and com compostable. But once you put something in there that has to be protected from air, because yep. air causes things to break down, or you know, in the consumer's case, we notice that they get stale. Um, that's where you get that bladder bag, that plastic bag inside of it, um, or you get a liner that's applied to the box. And in this case, um, a lot of the plastic and petroleum-based products today aren't biodegradable. So they might be um, repulpable. You know, you, you might be able to send it to a recycler who can do something with it. But if you were to stick it in your backyard, you know, the cardboard It'd would break still down. still be there. But the lining's still there. Exactly. Okay. So Stenco has a product called Stencoat, um, which is still in an early stage. They don't have a manufacturing facility yet, but we are partnering with them to test that out in fresh meat products. And we're really excited about it, again, because biodegradable trays exist, but the coatings don't exist. And this is early stage work that helps us place some bets on technology that we think is promising. Um, it allows us to be a partner to a startup company to help them grow and scale. Um, and as we think about where the test goes, we could become a natural customer of them, or we could find ways to deepen the relationship in the future. So to answer your question, I don't think it's a company people have heard of necessarily, yeah. but we do love working with them. Um, and they came to us through a startup accelerator, a global one called Plug and Play, okay. which some people will have heard of. Yeah. Um, Plug and Play has been a fantastic partner for us on innovation. They help us scout and look for startup partners. Um, they understand what Cargill Protein North America is looking for, um, and they help us advance startup companies and accelerate them. It's a great program awesome. that we're in. That sounds really cool. Um, what besides the kind of uh, packaging and and chemical science tech that you're you're doing with them? What other kinds of technology uh, kind of intersect in that egg world? that you're yeah. dealing with. In the protein business, I, I bring up packaging because I think sustainable packaging is, is a hot button for everyone right. in the CPG industry and the food industry. Um, so we have a lot of work streams focused on sustainable packaging, but outside of that, we're keenly interested in anything related to animal health. Um, we may not grow and raise our own cattle, um, but as a beef producer, we're we're interested in anything that helps us be better stewards of the environment. Um, we have a program called Beef Up, where we aim to reduce enteric methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Um, and that's important to us because where we can, we want to put animal 
treating animals well at the forefront, as well as raising them as efficiently as we can. That's better for the environment. So animal health matters a lot. Um, consumers are asking for the reduced use of antibiotics in the beef supply chain. So that matters a lot to us as well. Um, and as you start to think about when we get further upstream, um, while, we, while I may not be growing the grains that are fed to cattle, um, any work that we can do through a beef up program to sequester more carbon or to increase the efficiency of the production of row crops, you know, we're looking at technology like that as well. Um, mostly in tandem with other Cargill businesses. Cargill is one of the world's largest privately owned companies and it touches just about everything you eat and, and many things that you use and not just eat. Um, so we have the opportunity to work with other businesses pretty frequently. Um, food safety is top of mind always. Um, we care about feeding the world in a safe and responsible way. And part of that is making sure that our facilities are as clean as they can be and our food as safe as possible. So we're always looking for ways to eliminate E. coli and salmonella from the food supply chain. Um, outside of that, I would say we have pretty deep interest in what's happening in consumer trends. And if you start to think about the world of digitalization, um, smart devices, e-commerce, you know, people are shopping for and consuming food in ways that are really rapidly changing. COVID taught us that e-commerce is here to stay. Um, retailers are responding to that. And we need to be poised to address what consumers want as that's going to affect what our customers, being retailers, um, food service, outlets, restaurants, that affects what they're buying from Cargill. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, in that same kind of vein, you know, if people are, when they think about tech, they they tend to think about, you know, just coding or, or you know, web development, but there's so many other avenues and so many different careers that technology takes in these different industries. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe what types of careers or opportunities there are that are more technical within Cargill or that the, the industry that you're in on whole? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is when we think about STEM education, and I believe now in the K through 12 circles, it's actually STEAM. We've added art it into is. it, which yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I think about some of those traditional disciplines. We have a, an initiative called Facility of the Future where we are looking through our North American supply chain and our production facilities. And these are highly manual. Um, you can't take beef carcass and cut it with machines or robots right. today, um, but we have to modernize them. And so as you think about this whole world of robotics, there's going to be a revolution. You know, we had the industrial revolution. There's going to be a robotics revolution where robotics have to start scaling, becoming more um, affordable, more economical to deploy. And I don't, I'm not saying this is rise of the machines, you know, they're going to take yeah. over people, but yeah. it's called cobots in many industries. So you'll see people yeah. working alongside robots. Um, it helps us in safety, for example. It helps yeah. us with efficiencies, it helps with consistency. Um, robots are going to be aided by machine learning and artificial intelligence. Again, not in a way where the robots are taking us over, but in a way where they're, they're learning work quickly and they can repeat it and they don't get uh, repetitive use injuries, for example. Well, and that's so, why we have to know how to how to program them and manage them so that totally. we, we, we are we are still in at the top of that chain. <laughs> yeah, and I, I know we're, we're then going back to coding, but if you think about hardware design, you know, someone's going to have to figure out what's the best way to build these parts and put them together. Right. So that's a world for engineering, for coding, for all of that work. Um, I talked about food safety. You know, there's always going to be a world for chemists and biologists. As you start thinking about, and we're, to, to my knowledge, uh, we're not doing any work in this space, but if you got really crazy, couldn't you think about ways to reverse engineer some kind, some kind of science that could eliminate E. coli completely? And I'm talking about the worst kind um, of E. coli, I mean. So there's a whole world of, I think, 
medical, pharma, kind of science related research where we're studying ways to attack bacteria, to attack viruses without relying on antibiotics or chemicals. Right. Um, for a while, the new hot trend was microphage, phage or phage technology, where you essentially teach phages, bacteriophages to recognize E. coli and then go attack it. So I, I think we're going to see a lot more happening in that space, especially as technology evolves. If you think about the way we run tests in the lab today, you're physically running the test, but machine learning and artificial intelligence should get to the point where we're simulating those tests. And not, I'm not a scientist, so hopefully no one attacks me for some of these <laughs> terrible analogies. No, I, yeah. think, I think they get it. Yeah, and I would be remiss not to put a plug in for food science. It's not just meat science, but right. food science is in everything that we do every day. You know, there's a whole world in packaging and polymer scientists. That's, that's some chemistry, that's packaging engineering. So there's any number of ways to be taking these scientific disciplines and turning them around into a type of job or a form of research. Um, sustainability is another huge space. Um, we're going to have people, this is just a theory in the world of sustainability that I think like deep climate tech is one place where we really haven't explored how to solve some of the world's sustainability problems. There's always going to be a monetary aspect of, you know, you could develop the tech, but how are you going to pay for it? But I think all of those things are going to happen within, within our generation, really. Yeah, I think things are, are moving so much faster now and, and developments happen so quickly. Uh, it's not, not too far out. Um, uh, would you have any suggestions for maybe um, skills or certifications that people might look into uh, if they're interested in, in going into that, those kind of industries? Are there, are there kind of standards that, you know, certifications that are in place or, or anything you might suggest to, to people who want to get more involved in that world? Hmm. I think it's hard to come up with certifications because the technology and these industries are evolving so quickly. Yeah. I think there are professional conferences and networking opportunities that are equally valuable. Um, a lot of these big thinkers in ag tend to attend um, World Agritech and Future Food Tech. And so that's less on the formal learning side, more on the networking side. And just um, being aware of what the innovations and what things right. are kind of happening. Yeah, exactly. I think we are going to see a need for project managers and change managers as organizations are starting to adapt to this new way of working in the new world of technology, because yeah. that's going to change our functional business models. So there's always PMP for project managers. Um, there are all kinds of change management certifications out there. Um, I think ProSci is the big one, P-R-O-S-C-I, or maybe it's P-R-O-C-I. Um, and then I think sustainability education is a new and emerging space. Um, climate science, environmental science, I think we're going to be looking very hard at the business models we use today that generate greenhouse gases. And we're going to need people who have an innovative mindset and the education to do something differently and right. make change happen in big companies. Right. Uh, what what is on the horizon that excites you? Is there any you know any innovations that you kind of track and are get excited about when you think about what's coming or anything you'd want to share with us? I think the big sexy thing that comes to mind is every time I go to a food and ag conference, there are these automated tractors. I am very curious to see what's going to happen on the farm generationally yeah. um, as we see American farmers retiring and who's coming in behind them. I think we're going to see a change in the way business is conducted. I, this is not Cargill's opinion, it's my opinion, but yeah. I think different generations may want to take crops to market differently, which 
really shakes up how those transactions are conducted today in person. And it takes us into the world of online marketplaces. And I don't really know what that's going to look like, but I'm excited to see what happens when a farmer or rancher decides they want to sell their crops, big or small, um, online. Um, I think I am very curious to see what's going to happen globally as other developing countries start to export more products. I think that will be unlocked by online marketplaces as well. Um, then I'd love to see, this is a bit of a change of subject, but when I think of last mile delivery, how stuff gets into my home. Yeah. I have no idea what it's going to look like, but we are bound to have some kind of shakeup because we are still using the same model that we had when milkmen delivered milk to your house. It's just that the milkman's uniform has changed, you know, into an, a blue Amazon vest right. <laughs> instead. And so I think there's, I don't know, I don't have a clue if it's drones or what it is, but something's going to change there. There's no way it's going to be someone physically driving stuff to your home and dropping it off. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when you were talking about the, the online space for farming, I'm like, I had this envision of like farm to table Etsy, <laughs> which would be super cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I even think farmers markets can have shaken it up a little bit, right. but that's still a fairly traditional model. So there's got, yeah. got to be something where you or I can get onto your phones and say, I am looking for a steak that was sustainably raised for tomorrow, delivered yeah. to my house. And somehow that's going to happen. Right. Uh, and I, I think I love what you talked about a little bit earlier about making sure that there's that connection between uh, what the consumer wants and getting that information to the producer so that there's there's the closed loop, right, of of what the need is in the market to providers and then getting those things to them. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for uh, innovation in our in our ways of delivering that and and communicating those needs. So um, lastly, before we go, I'm just wondering if you can can give us uh, maybe one or two things that are are coming up for your your division um, and things might people might keep an eye on. Uh, in your industry, specifically for Cargill, like if there are some events or if there's um, some initiatives, like you mentioned the Beef Up program, like if there's things that that people can just kind of tune into a little bit more and get on their radar. Hmm. I've already talked a little bit about our relationship with Stenco. Um, yeah. A lot of what I am working on is not public facing yet. Right. Um, but I would say, I hope that people keep an eye out on the Cargill's protein business to see what we're cooking up in sustainable packaging. I think there are going to be really exciting ways for us to do more, not just to be using environmentally friendly packaging, but to start to develop relationships where we can shake up the packaging industry. And I don't mean, I'm not saying that Cargill is going to get into packaging, but yeah. I think there's, there's, more creative ways to look at it than we just buy it, we package it. So I, I think we should, I am excited to see what happens in that space. Um, on the beef upside, I'm always excited to see what kinds of partnerships we're cooking up. You know, we have a relationship with uh, Target, Burger King, McDonald's. Those are some of our big customers. And we have many, including Walmart as well. Yeah. Um, and we're always looking at ways to partner with them to deliver more sustainable products. So I think that's a great place to keep an eye out. Um, and then I guess a, a plug to cargo would be that we are in many of the food products that people eat every day. So if you've had a, a quarter pounder at McDonald's or a cheeseburger at Sonic, you know, I, I guess that's probably more of a, uh, a regional reference than anything else. Yeah. Or if you buy meat at Aldi or Target um, or Walmart, you're really consuming Cargill products. And it's just nice to know that we've got a footprint everywhere and we're in everyone's homes. That is awesome. Thank you for, for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I'm assuming it's just the cargill.com website or do you have a separate 
separate no, web you, address for you for can your find name. everything there is to know about Cargill and Cargill.com. Uh, but we have, and we have many products besides animal meat products. So, well, thank you so much for your time, Donna. And I really uh, appreciate you giving us a little glimpse of, of what you do. Yeah, thank you. Code Savvy Presents is produced by Code Savvy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization committed to making computer science accessible. Visit us at www.codesavvy.org.